everyone, uh, and welcome to our, uh, our uh, January RPA lecture. Um, I'm Alex Howard, and I'm an RPA board member, and I've been organizing these uh, lectures. Um, we hope you and yours are all well. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have in-person lectures um, soon enough. But uh, in the meantime, we're really pleased to be able to bring uh, you our lectures virtually. Uh, this year, we've been uh, looking at conservation issues, climate change, forest regeneration, um, wildlife conservation, trails, public access to that, to, uh, uh, to uh, woodlands, air and water quality, and so on. Uh, we've actually, I think this is the seventh one um, next, uh, next month, uh, Ethan Winter will, will talk about, uh, uh, clean energy and, uh, and, uh, climate change. And, uh, uh, oh, by the way, um, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but if you missed any of these lectures and would like to view them, uh, you can find them on the RPA website. Just look for lecture videos under the topic programs and outings. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, Rachel will talk to us about um, uh, fragmentation. Uh, she is uh, with the, she's, um, uh, she's a, uh, a geographer and um, also a NRPA board member. And uh, so, uh, I think uh, I would like to invite her to take over from here. Sounds good. So as long as you can hear me, um, I've been working on uh, forest fragmentation and urbanization for a while now because of their effects on forest systems and ecosystem resilience. And I changed the original title a bit, which said landscape change in it, to urbanization only to bring right up front the fact that our biggest landscape change factor currently is urbanization. So I come at this question from a national monitoring perspective. And the US Forest Service and the Forest Inventory and Analysis have been working on ways to robustly measure and monitor the fragmentation and urbanization of forest land for a while now, because we know that the status of our forest land isn't fully described by forest area or volume or species or age structure, but that the spatial distribution and the landscape context in which that forest is located is an important characteristic of that forest land that influences a lot of things, including the pressures that it's facing and how it might change over time. So what it affects and how we know that are some of the things that I'll be talking about. So I thought I'd just first give a quick introduction to the US Forest Service and forest inventory and analysis. And I started doing this ever since I went to several high school classes and discovered that almost no one there had heard of the US Forest Service or the US Geological Survey or any of our other federal natural resource agencies for that matter. So here the, the Forest Service, just quick, the Forest Service is divided up into three uh, main areas. The National Forest System is responsible for the management of specific areas of land, the National Forest. And then research and development is responsible for conducting sound research to improve our understanding of forest systems to support decision-making at um, both the management and planning and policy levels. And then state and for private forestry acts partly like county extension and partly as a grant funding arm to support state and private efforts to connect forestry to people. So I'm part of the Northern Research Station and that's made up of a bunch of several different types of locations, research work units, which can include a variety of different labs associated with the different research, um, urban field stations, and then research lands, research natural areas and experimental forests on which they do long-term ecological research. The unit I work for is the Forest Inventory and Analysis Unit, which is actually a national program, though it's still housed regionally in the research stations, which given the differences in forest ecosystems and forest use patterns between the different regions still makes sense. 
although there's a strong effort made for national consistency. The forest inventory was established in 1928 and was the third nationwide forest inventory in the world at that time. It's not actually a census, but a sample. It's a network of ground plots, each representing 6,000 acres of land area, of which there are about 5,000 in New York and about 50 in Rensselaer County. Um, they're both forested and non-forest plots. So I've been thinking about fragmentation and urbanization impacts on the forest in terms of ecosystem resilience. And ecosystem resilience is a dynamic situation related to ecosystem function. And I've get defined it as one in which the system is self-sustaining. Natural regeneration is occurring, breeding populations of wildlife are naturally sustained, either entirely within the area or including flows from elsewhere. Water and nutrient flows and cycles are sustained. And a well-functioning ecosystem typically requires an area of sufficient size, of sufficient connectivity, and is typically a complex of spatially related ecosystems. So for example, the functioning of a wetland depends on the surrounding forest and vice versa. So a resilient ecosystem is one that can hopefully maintain all those functions in the face of disturbance factors that we may not be able to control locally, like fluctuating temperatures and precipitation patterns and levels, or shifts in natural disturbances such as fire and drought, or changing atmospheric concentrations or relative phenologies or invasive species or diseases. And also in the face of human use pressures and disturbances, either because of services we want such as recreation or demand for water and land for housing or harvesting, or because our population is having effects like air and water pollution or overbrowsing from a lot of deer. So what do we get when we have resilient forest ecosystems that are sufficiently resilient to the disturbances happening and the services we're asking of them? Well, that's when we get a sustained source of clean water for drinking and recreation. We get that regulated water flow. We get those positive contributions to regional air quality and pollution processing. We get this maintenance of habitats for a wide variety of plants and animals and this sustained supply of forest products and this continuation of high quality outdoor recreation. Put another way, a resilient ecosystem will hopefully be able to continue to give us what we've come to expect from our forests, such as this list of what the Vermont, um, Vermont identified in its Vermont Forest Fragmentation Report in 2015. And a lot of these similar products and services were identified by the Rensselaer Plateau Plan and in the State Forest Action Plans. So forest fragmentation affects this resilience. Here's just a, a cartoon of this at the scale of an individual patch in which we have a small patch and a larger patch one of which is on the other side of an important threshold. In each of these patches, there are plants and land and aquatic animals. These could be the ones still there from before the patch was isolated from the rest of the surrounding forest. And the disturbance could be natural or it could be the result of human activity or a combination of both. The disturbance may kill or remove some of the plants and animals for a while. And an ecosystem is considered res to be resilient to that disturbance if it's able over time to build back and recover. Maybe not exactly, but recognizably, and its overall ecosystem functioning is restored. A patch that is not resilient to that disturbance may just continue to lose species and functions. And where that important threshold is, is absolutely affected by what's in the overall landscape and how much of it is forested or other natural habitats. In addition, as you can imagine, what's in between those forest patches matters, especially when you're talking about plants and creatures and other than birds. And urban development is one of those land uses that can have an enormous impact, which is why we're tracking urbanization too. So let's take a look at this region and the Rensselaer Plateau. So I divided it into three acts, really. This is uh, in act one, most of this area looked like this maybe a few centuries ago in relatively uninterrupted swaths across the landscape, 
relatively subtly influenced by Mohican presence and natural disturbances, at least compared to our typical disturbances today. And then the Mohicans lived in and with the forest and rivers for centuries, many, many, many centuries. But the European settlers who came here were more familiar with living by farming cleared land and thus cleared much of the area, resulting in what I'm calling Act Two. And then as Eastern farms were abandoned for when farms, farmers moved to easier land in the West, the forest grew back and with it came shifts toward livelihoods in forest related industries, such as charcoal and ferns and sugaring. And so that agricultural abandonment has led to a lot of forest regrowth. And with this regrowth of forest has come the return of numerous species of wildlife that had been eliminated during the period of heavy clearing and sometimes extermination hunting. So now we see moose and fisher and otter and beaver and bear and eagle and raven and deer that weren't there during those other times. So looking at these three acts in graph form, we see first a big decline in forest land in this region due to ag agriculture, followed by some regrowth. And the FIA data has been showing us that this rise of urbanization has now overtaken the conversion of farmlands to forest. And we're now seeing a decline in forest area again. So the question is, where do we go from here? And where do we want to go? So another factor we're contending with is this continued rise in human populations. This is a similar graph to the last one. And it's added this um, New England, this is just of the New England states broken out from a wildlands and woodlands report over the same time period. And population is in that black dotted line is just steadily and still increasing. So these numbers in, in here and in the previous graph are of forest area and not forest fragmentation, but the story up to this point is still similar. The only difference is that the fragmentation and urbanization can influence the forest beyond what's actually cleared. And just to give a landscape perspective of what this might look like in this area, here is a, a very obvious fabrication of what the landscape might have looked like in 1850. And compared to what it looks like now, this is actually 2010 image, but we've regained a lot of that forest area back on the plateau and a lot of that forest connectivity back between all those little teeny patches. But there are some other things happening now, most notably development. So what are forest fragmentation and urbanization? Forest fragmentation is the dividing up spatially of forest into smaller and smaller pieces or patches. And here I'm gonna to attempt to use a laser pointer. And so maybe, so it can go from going from relatively continuous canopy here to intrusions of non-forest land uses creating more non-forest, non-forest edges and reducing forest interior area to landscape patches over here of forest within a mostly non-forest matrix to over here, increasingly isolated patches of forest. So those are sort of different conditions that we're taking a look at. Laser pointer. Um, so urbanization is simply this, the increasing density or proximity of urban development to forest land. And here, sometimes taking a look at the landscape um, in three different time periods. So seeing it change over time makes it easier to see. And this is a landscape in Eastern Massachusetts, south of Boston where you can see over time that how the forest in green is gradually disappearing and that's the forest loss and the remaining forest is reduced to increasingly smaller less connected more isolated patches the remaining forest land is exposed to more pressures and more vulnerable to changes and you can see in the bottom row of three how um, if the the what land remains tends to be then that's the mile standard state forest there the only reasonably large undeveloped lands become those that are protected. 
So housing density is one way we measure urbanization. It's consistently measured by the US Census Bureau every decade. And to perhaps give the numbers some meaning, if this makes more sense, um, six houses per square kilometer is about a house for every 40 acres. And 50 houses per square kilometer is about a house for every five acres. So looking at the change with, we can look at the change with each decadal census. Um, and this next graphic is gonna depict some of the changes in house density from in New York. This is the census partial block groups, but it's starting at about 1940. And as you watch the gradual loss of the dark green and the increases in reds and oranges, you'll be able to see how this has been progressing. And it's predicted into 2030. And two statistics relevant to the plateau were that the population growth in plateau towns was about five times greater between 2000 and 2010 than the rest of the county. And this and woodland parcelization, which sometimes is a precursor to fragmentation, which is the dividing up of ownership parcels into smaller ownerships, was 11.2%, which is the fourth highest in of any county in eastern New York. So the result of all that is that the fragmentation and urbanization are one of the dominant regional stressors on forests in this region and in many regions. And the Forest Service actually put together several detailed reports outlining a region specific framework for climate change response. And in every single one of them, fragmentation and landscape change were identified as one of the top current major stressors and threats to forest systems. And several of the other threats such as forest diseases and insect pests are themselves heavily influenced by fragmentation and urbanization. So why are they such big stressors and what impacts do they have? So this has been looked at over small and large areas you know, using many different data sources. And some of what's been observed are that wildlife impacts on wildlife are things like decrease in diversity or breeding success or recovery or species abundance. Water can be affected in its flow variability, increased sedimentation, loss of sensitive macroinvertebrates, and its biogeochemical cycles. We can see in the forest increased number of exotics, more insect and disease movement, lower regeneration, fewer standing dead trees. Forest management is impacted, their treatment constraints. And for recreation, there could be less area available, more restrictions on the recreation increased travel distance required by people to get there, and then increasing pressure on remaining lands. So I thought I'd just pull out a few studies to illustrate where this information comes from that, that filled in that list on the previous slide. And this is just, so just looking at examples and impacts on wildlife, this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as part of their Partners in Flight program, used the breeding bird census data and landscape data to better understand habitat suitability for specific bird species. And in particular, those that preferred or required interior forest conditions. So in that, as you'll recognize this slide, um, in one set of studies, they took a look at the relationship of different bird species to forest patch sizes and the overall amount of forest in the landscape to try to identify under what conditions a forest patch can be considered highly suitable moderately suitable or low quality habitat. So for example, in this illustration, they identified that in an area which had 70% forest cover in that 2,500 acre area, the minimum patch size for it to be highly suitable was only 66 acres. Whereas in an area that was only 40% forest cover, that highly suitable, in order to be highly suitable habitat, it had to be 605 acres in total. So what they did was they compiled tables from all those observations of how suitable a patch of forest was likely to be given its patch size and landscape context. And these tables can be used by forest planners and land managers who have access to these to maps of patch size and forest density. So looking at impacts on water, um, one example was a study that Karen Reva Murray from the US Geological Survey and I 
um, did using photo interpreted land cover data and water quality samples from 50 watersheds across a range of urbanization patterns and different urbanization levels in the Delaware River Basin. And we did that to examine how land use and land cover affected water quality. So in a fully forested watershed, tree canopies and micro topographies and downwooding material and duff layer and woodland and stream mosses and developed soils intercept the runoff, hold groundwater for longer, steadier flows after rains, filter water, and the soils remain where they are. But what happens when a watershed is made up of other land uses and land covers? So what we observed was that with increasing urbanization, there was a loss of sensitive macroinvertebrates, an increase in chloride and sulfate and other major ions, an increase in nutrient concentrations, and an increase in pesticide toxicity. And it's obviously correlated with road density here, but there's a, a lot of noise. And we wanted to a closer look at which specific landscape factors were making things worse or better. And also particularly interested in those landscape factors that I tend to call management relevant, things that you can actually do something about, that you could change and in shorter timeframes. For that, we use the sensitive macroinvertebrates because in a lot of ways they represent the sum of the other responses. So percent impervious cover in the watershed was hands down the dominant factor. But in addition to that, there were other factors that were distinctly correlated, making things in the watershed worse or better for macroinvertebrates. So for a given degree of urbanization, represented by percent impervious, stream condition is made worse by more grass, more agriculture, and more edge and patchiness in the forest. In contrast, for a given percent impervious, the negative effects of urbanization on stream condition can be lessened by allowing for more trees in general, more trees in urban areas, increased tree cover in the stream buffer, and more contiguous and connected forests and more wetlands. Looking at forest composition and structure, our current understanding is much less well understood as far as what changes are happening in the forest uh, when they become urbanized. So relatively local observations from forested urban and suburban parks had observed over time that a degraded, that the sites were degraded. Species composition and structure have been altered or simplified and a lot of exotic species occurred. But how consistent is this observation in other places? So what we're doing now is taking advantage of this, the extensive forest data available in the FIA inventory in combination with the census house density change data and investigating whether we are in fact observing changes in forest structure and or composition on forest land over broad areas, including forest that has more recently been urbanized. And some of the initial things that are showing up are that we are seeing in in both, and so here, the, the green is the forest land. The gray is, is, is uh, just ignore the gray for now. <laughs> the green is forest land. And the two, the darker orange is are forests that have been in the wildland urban interface. So they have had high densities, um, higher levels of, of uh, house density for 30 plus years. So from 1990 or before. And in the lighter pink, it's, that's more recent urbanization. And, and we can see how both of those there's so we're seeing the live seedlings per acre are noticeably significantly less in the wildland urban interface in when it's urbanized. The live trees from one to five inches, so that's our sapling and pole timber size trees, significantly less. And our standing dead trees are less in those areas. So why? What's happening? Uh, we're still investigating, but even the preliminary results suggest that something's happening. And so we need to be monitoring den housing density levels in and near forest land. So studies like all of those above are providing us with increasingly detailed information about which landscape and urbanization characteristics really do appear to be correlated with impacts. So here I've listed them um, broken out by the same issues in the earlier slide. 
kind of indicating and what this is due. So we have landscape compositions and patch sizes, housing density, um, amounts of edge. And <clears throat> what this list does is it indicates the factors that we should be monitoring and maybe taking management and planning steps to address or to mitigate. So some of the factors that we're tracking over broad areas. So these are data sets that are available nationwide or region wide are things like the spatial integrity index that is a it's a combination and all the, the pieces are available too, but patch size, uh, connectivity and then and local forest density. This wildland urban intermix, which is census house density and everything that's above a six houses per square kilometer. Um, and roads, roads are also remain a, a really important factor to in, invasives among other things. And so these large data sets are available uh, broadly um, and are being used in planning things like the, the 2020 state forest action plans that the, at least the 20 Northeastern states completed. So, and these are things that are used for strategic planning to address issues like maintaining forest health or forest productive capacity or forest contributions to global carbon cycles or maintaining and enhancing the socioeconomic benefits. And these broad scales can sometimes give us a pretty good picture of how rare some of these conditions are um, or the extent of some of the pressures over broad scales. And this just a zoomed in look at these metrics over the Rensselaer Plateau. Here are the spatial integrity index in the blue. Um, and the darker blue is the core, core forest, core high integrity forest. Um, is calculated at two different scales. And then there's the house density. So the house density is in brown and the green is the uh, forest that is not, has not been urbanized. And then distance to road. And we've actually got a, a lot more detailed information on house density change now. So been able to take the census data and bring it down to the block level and really look at and calibrate it back and really be able to take a look at a, a finely detailed um, spatial detail change of 1990 to 2010. And hopefully if we solve the, if they're able to solve the issues with the 2020 census, we'll be able to uh, have it out to 2020 and not have to wait too, too long to get that data. But you can take a look here, it's showing where, so in the, the purples became wooey, the tans have, the tans and browns have been wooey since 1990 or before. And I, that's that, what wooey is that wildland urban interface. Um, the purple became wooey during, in the 90s and the, blue became wooey in the 2000s. And then we can take some of that data and here just use that information to take a look at where these um, house densities above that wooey threshold of six houses per square kilometer, where they occur in what would otherwise be considered core forest, which is a lot of places. And the on the right is right, pretty close to where we are. Um, there's only half the plateau in the picture, but, uh, and the left is the New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts coastline there. We're also tracking the local landscape pattern type. So the one on the left is where the green is, it's where it's mostly forest and the blue is mostly ag and the reds are where it's mostly developed. And then all the mixtures in between is where the colors merge. We're also tracking edge type. <laughs> so forest development edges and then forest agricultural edges. Um, so where they are, where the forest development or forest agricultural edges are high, since these two types of edges will have likely be associated with somewhat different effects. And when it comes down to a particular landscape, the, the details do matter. So where possible, local knowledge and more detailed information, if it exists, can be really invaluable. And this is just zooming into the Rensselaer Plateau and taking advantage of some of the data that exists for the plateau 
um, and similar information, I think now for the county as well. So, and with so more detailed information about where those important forest intact forest blocks are is useful or which forest corridors between them are critical or what the full aquatic network picture is like on the in in your area on the plateau or maybe more detailed information on stand size or forest type or forest maturity um, or rare habitats And we don't have this over broad areas, but when you have it, when you have it locally, that's great to be able to take advantage of. So I think that one of the most important questions is, is that can we, through good and appropriate planning and management, reduce and redirect urban sprawl and or render it in a form less harmful to the ecosystems in which it's occurring? There are things that we already know about how the landscape affects and impacts ecosystems that we can use. So just pulling an example from the Plateau Conservation Plan, we can use the information we have to inform new development, such as concentrating the development to minimize fragmentation, or avoiding crossing streams and I can try to use my pointer again. There we go. Um, avoiding crossing streams over here or avoiding rare habitats such as these bogs here or wetlands. And with respect to existing development, The details do matter. Um, it matters how we live on the, and manage the land in our residences. It, man, it matters how we farm our agricultural areas. It matters how we develop and use our recreation areas. And it matters how we maintain our roads and parking areas or how much impervious surface versus grass versus tree cover we maintain or whether we provide habitat cover for wildlife in those areas how well our road and stream crossings prevent road runoff going directly into the streams, or how our development has changed the changes the local hydrology. So when it comes to regional ecosystem resilience, which ecosystems matter? And that's just a final closing thought. And, and the, the answer is all of these ecosystems because not only do we immediately benefit from functioning ecosystems in each of these areas, but they all affect each other. So not only can the green infrastructure in urban areas enhance urban resilience to climate change and, <laughs> hang on, <laughs> um, and pandemics for that matter, but it can in increase, decrease their urban impacts on surrounding natural areas. And from the perspective of the forests on the Rensselaer Plateau, not only do these forests depend on their immediate surroundings for their resilience, but the forest complexes are influenced by the larger landscape in which they occur. And I'll stop there, which should give us time. for any questions, <laughs> if there are any. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, um, that was great, it's so interesting. Um, it seems to me that so much of this is in the hands of the local planning and zoning boards. And that, you know, I'm just really wondering, like, how do you influence that? Because I understand all these principles so well, but if you look anywhere, <laughs> the decisions of whether another lot gets built in another small piece of 
trees get cut down and a few more houses go up are always in the hands of you know local planning boards have any comment about that yeah, yeah yeah so yeah right local planning boards are 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 a big factor for new developments um and they don't seem to take this very much into consideration i guess is the point i want to add yeah and 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 there's sometimes there are still um uh, rules that are old rules that they have to go by which which so you may not be able to concentrate a development because your um the rule for septic systems isn't up to the new so so there's a, a lot of pieces along the way but but one of the things that you you we can also do is improve the actually the existing development. So the existing development that we do have in our either residential, you know, suburban areas and rural, residential and urban areas, we we can influence what's on those. So there we're talking to ourselves and to other individuals. And to public spaces it's a different it's not planning for new development but it's improving the old development so and that can have a big big effect can you give an example well in, increasing the so if you have the the more uh tree cover versus grass cover was one of the things that we found and that's something that you could you know we can change in our existing development it's you know plantable space um, an opportunity to, to plant for us and increasing the, the green infrastructure in our urban areas can, will, can have an effect. And, and, you know, put sometimes when a development goes in, the hydrology has been dramatically changed too. And so taking sometimes things like that, you might be able to revise something take take steps to make that the impact of that a little less so so those but all of those right local planning for new development and then and also existing development yeah thank you <laughs> Rachel there is a question there's a question in the chat here uh, which is what good effect does the ownership by Babcock Lake Estates of some forester, forested area have? Yeah, so, so, Bab, so that was an, is an example of an area, Babcock Lake Estates. Actually, I don't know how it's distributed. So I'm assuming it's Babcock Lake Estates is a clustered um, development. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, it's um, actually a series of rather old homes around the shores of Babcock Lake, and the estates bought the undeveloped land and protects them. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So there. So there is is um, by by clustering the development there, or or and by protecting the area around it, then there that that forest will presumably remain forest and, and remain a piece in the landscape that could serve, depending on what's around it, as a, a connecting feature in the landscape to other forest lands. Mm -hmm. So. We don't cut those trees or drag them out if they die or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So leaving lots of wildlife habitat in there sounds like. However, there are a bunch of septic systems around the actual lake, mm -hmm. some of which are not new. Right, and and maybe in need of attention, some of them. That's, I would think so, yes. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's and, Larry MacArthur, I'm not Larry MacArthur, I'm missing <laughs> MacArthur. Um, Yeah, that's true for other lakes and even in urban areas too, the, the, the in water infrastructure can be, um, can be old, so yeah. Yeah, okay. feel free to ask questions in the chat too. Let me see here. Okay, uh, there's a, uh, what looks like a comment here and then a couple of other questions. Uh, yeah. Sure, stormwater management education for landowners can help people learn how to minimize runoff by planting trees, etc. she says. Yep, 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 definitely. 
Okay. Now uh, and I, I see a I see a hand up question, so I'm going to say now. But see, I can see you because you're in my view screen. There's a whole other page. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay. Yeah, Hi, Rachel. Uh, Hi. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. A uh, uh, kind of curious question because I haven't been thinking about some of these issues for many years, but I remember like 20, 25 years ago in Portland, Oregon, they had that whole urban growth boundary where they actually they limited and within the growth boundary, you could do a lot of things, development, building, whatnot. And then on the other side of it, very limited. Um, and did anyone, has anyone over the years ever studied that? Are they still doing it? Is it successful? Yeah, Wait, now I know a couple other, I don't know Portland, but I know play, like Boulder has done mm -hmm. the same kind of thing. Um, and then Chicago has got this emerald necklace around it. Right. And the benefit, the biggest benefit that I hear most, I don't know who studied it for local water quality or wildlife or anything, but the big benefit that I hear is that all the residents just love the proximity, you know, mm -hmm. by, by stopping that development there, having development inside the city, having a place of uh, this stretch of area that doesn't have development and then development outside means there's this stretch of non-development that everybody in the city can access. And so it's the proximity that I've really, I, am, I can only imagine there's every other benefit there too from it. But um, I think Minneapolis did the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, so the cities that did are really loving the, when, they, when they did that, so. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. So Alice, I've lost complete track of yeah. questions. Uh, there's a couple other questions here. Uh, is there an effort by state to reach out to forest donors to conserve adjacent woodlands? And then uh, he says on the plateau. Yeah. Jim, do you want to? Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Uh, let me turn my camera. <laughs> um, so I think I can't speak for the state. Um, I don't know that they're making an effort, but RPA certainly is. We, we've, um, you know, we don't want to badger landowners and we don't, um, we want to be gentle about inviting people in, but we have sent mailings out to um, a large majority of, of landowners on the plateau, letting them know that um, if they're interested in conserving their forest in any number of ways, um, selling it, putting it, uh, you know, putting a conservation easement on it, learning more about how to steward it well themselves um, that we're here to help. So there, there is, um, there has been outreach to that effect and, and we are, um, you know, we'll do everything we can to, you know, respond to those uh, landowners that want to, to conserve their, their land. And I see a question here by um, from Michael Fishman, um, and it's about this, well, I can read it. Given the fact that the Northeast is more forested now than it has been for much of the last century, and there's this loss of grassland bird species due to lack of early successional habitats, <clears throat> how do you balance that, that need? And, and I think that there are... Um, we, we have in our, in our developed, like we can take our developed spaces and our, we've got a lot of, you know, big areas of commercial, um, oh, like corporate parks, corporate, what am I trying to say? Anyway, that, that where there's big expanses of grassland and instead of turning those into mowed, just having them mowed areas, have them be so early successional habitats. So, so I think that there are, you know, rather than uh, necessarily clearing a, a, a mature forest, you, well, you, we, we want, I mean, you could do that too, but um, 
but you wouldn't want to do it that was cutting, cutting, uh, decreasing your, your connectivity. So, so I think you can balance it. And I think that there are, just like there's a lot of opportunities in urban areas for increasing our green space, there's a lot of opportunities for increasing the um, early successional uh, habitat too. That's actually real er early successional habitat. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a really good answer, Rachel, and I appreciate that. Uh, another question, if I may tag on to that, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm involved, I, I, I'm an environmental consultant and I do work with developers and I'm very heavily involved with solar development. Mm. And so there's this tremendous uh, tug of war going on with solar development in New York State, which is being heavily promoted here mm -hmm. in uh, where to put it. Mm. Um, and I've worked with developers that have chosen entirely forested parcels, which mm -hmm. would require clearing 45, 50, 60 acres of forest to, to build a solar farm. Uh, and then of course, there's the, what is considered across much of the state to be a preferred alternative of taking agricultural lands mm -hmm. and converting it to solar. However, that's a convert, that can be a conversion to prime farmland, which then takes right. away from some of the most productive agricultural lands that we have. Right. So, you know, what I try to work with my clients with, for the most part is uh, try to concentrate the, the, the clearing in one place rather than taking postage stamp cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me anyway, seems to meet the goal of not fragmenting in tiny little pieces, but if you're going to break the forest canopy to do it in larger areas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then to create more meaningful habitat areas of early successional field. Right. Right, right, right. That makes just like clustered development, you know, right. clustering. Right, that's right, okay. that's right, right. What's what are the just a quick question for you while you're, um, mm -hmm. uh, what are the options or or the the growth towards solar developments in in already developed areas? So that that is an option, and I know that that um, some of the state regulations have. Um, been actually altered or and there's proposals to alter them further uh, to promote, for example, development of, of uh, solar arrays on landfills, closed landfills. It's a great mm -hmm. use for that, that, that type of land. Mm -hmm. uh, and also for brownfields, mm -hmm. brownfields mm -hmm. for, for that kind of development. Mm -hmm. um, with brownfields, you can run into the issue that brownfields are usually in urban areas. Urban areas, generally the property values are higher. And so it's a, it costs more even if they're impacted lands. Really? Um, well, because it's a, it's, it's a loss of potential use that would potentially have a, a higher tax base. Uh, building a large building where lots of people live or work can bring in a higher tax bill. And we do that on brownfields? We can do that? And, on brownfields. Yes, um, if the brownfields are remediated. Right. Um, and I don't want to get into... Right, 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 right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> uh, you yeah, very much. But, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but as far as used lands, yes, there are incentives that are being promoted for that. Yeah. But of course, once you get out through the rest of the state, um, out in central New York area, you know, much of the area is agricultural or forested. And so the question becomes a toss up, which do you take forest land or agricultural land? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Hey, Rachel, uh, Rick? I just want to jump in and oh, sorry, Alice is going to do the same thing that I'm going to do. There, there are questions that you skipped. So oh, I dear. suggest we like make sure we go in order. So we, we yeah. get everybody's questions there. There's one from uh, Daniel. Um, uh, Keeper. Keeper. Yeah. Alice is on top of this. I'll let you. Oh, uh, good, Alice. Try, Thank to, try you. to go through yeah, the order. I was just going to mention that there was uh, there was one before uh, Michael's. And uh, uh, Daniel says, Rachel's list of examples of how the details matter is very good. So what leverage is available to turn these into such things as community outreach and advocacy, landholder education, activity by land trust, and education of policymakers? That's good. I think we have a, probably a community here of people who might know the answer to that question. Because um, that is that is exactly what the list wants is turning that into community outreach, right? Okay, um, here's one from uh, Ingrid Hackle. 
Uh, is your research also looking at trends in forest sea secret, secret sequestration storage? I've heard interesting research from Andrew Reinman about high potential for sea, you can say it's secret station <laughs> in urban forest. Though I think there are questions about how that will play out long term and other anticipated climate change, climate change impacts. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to that first. First, Daniel, I'm going to think about that that answer. I'm going to get back to you. Okay. So, yeah. um, so carbon sequestration and storage. So I um, potential for carbon sequestration in urban forests. Um, I haven't been looking at that, but we do have in the forest inventory of a forest carbon group that 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 has that does you know it's got to pull together the statistics of carbon across the whole area and and calculate it up and urban urban areas and urban forests are becoming a bigger and bigger piece all the time, bigger chunk of of what's going on just because as our urbanization comes out. So I, I can't think, um, I think that's still coming. So I don't think we, I don't think I have any more answers right now um, as to, as to how, how much of a role they play right now. Um, so I think that there, if, if it comes to the question of, of do you add forests to urban areas to for carbon sequestration, I think in some ways you don't have to answer that specific number question because there's so many other good reasons for adding trees and green space to urban areas. Um, but I can I can check with, with Grant, Grant Domke is the one who's working on it in FIA and I can certainly check Ingrid and see um, see what he see what he's got for those. Okay, uh, Tracy says, "Young Forest Initiative promotes more edge habitat." And Tracy, is that an initiative that exists? It sounds like. I think that might have been addressing Michael's question originally earlier. Right, and David Farron uh, also says, Boston also has an emerald necklace. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Um, in another land fragmentation webinar, I recently watched from the Northern Rockies, data from large mammal migratory studies established critical migration corridors. This graphically visualizes the importance of connectivity and prevention of fragmentation. Might there be a similar poster child species for the plateau to help graphically show the importance of connectivity? I th yeah, the large, the large mammals, certainly when we, when we look at the plat, think about the plateau and there's there, that one, one picture had connectivity between the large patches on the plateau and which corridors were important to preserve. But there's also which, where on the plateau, how do we connect to the larger forested landscape to the south, to the Berkshires and to the north, into the greens and the Adirondacks and maintaining those connections. So, um, and, and large mammals are gonna be the ones that are gonna you know, take the most advantage of that. So, th so there, there might be, I know there's um, a corridor project, the, Oh, I forget the name of it now. That's following. Follow the forest. Follow the forest. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, and I don't know if they're using large species or not, but it's but you can um, seeing that connectivity and the movement of the species and that the the nature conservancy with their resilient connected and resilient landscapes they're really thinking of how things are going to move with climate change and they've put together some pretty compelling pictures too of how species are going to move 
from where they are and are they going to move directly north or are they going to move east? And this whole Appalachian corridor becomes a big piece of that. Yeah. Well, Rachel, we have had the uh, the little iconic moose in uh, in many of our uh, publications and letters because um, they're they're out there on the plateau and they're fun to see and see the signs of and so. I don't know if we've gone quite to, you know, making them the poster child, but we kind of got close to that yeah. there for a while. Annie could speak to that too. Um, yeah, we talk about the, the bobcat too, because they are a wider ranging species. So they, they just need larger forest blocks generally mm -hmm. and whatever connectivity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and forest interior bird species that need like the spotted owl that Rachel was showing need need larger forest blocks to have quality habitat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it looks like the next question is for me. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is RPA supportive of solar farms on the plateau? Um, how do I answer that? We're, I guess, you know, we, I was asked early on about, um, we, we haven't talked a lot about it, honestly, but I was asked early on about like wind and, you know, if we would be opposed to um, uh, wind turbines on the plateau. And so the answer to that question is no, <clears throat> we would not be opposed. And we don't oppose, we don't really oppose anything. We work to, you know, to outpace uh, development with conservation, moving forward in a positive direction. So we don't oppose things. We wouldn't oppose solar farms either. And the idea of clean energy um, is great. So, uh, you know, I personally am very supportive of clean energy. So it's just a matter of, you know, locating them properly, um, like we talked about earlier. Um, and um, what was I going to say that, um, yeah, I don't know what I was going to say. Look at, yeah, <laughs> like we're not opposed that we don't oppose to anything really is what comes down to. So. Um, so there's, it says I touched on deer overbrowsing and the effect of forest regeneration. It also affects the growth of wildflowers, which affects insects and birds. So I think that's just a extra addition to the. Are there any other questions? I think I've got them all here. I have a thought. Sure. The thought is that if you had to have a solar farm or a whole bunch of houses with driveways and other things that uh, keep the water from going down, it will go down under solar panels. So a solar farm would be a better thing than some sort of a development. Yes, I think there, there are a lot of ways in which they ha that has a lot lower effect. There, there are a lot of impacts of development and, and it all depends on you know, how we do it and how we live on it. And I think this is the true of same with solar farms is, is there's lots of, there's a lot of work being done to try to, how can we combine land uses with solar farms? How can we make it not just solar farms, but something else, grow something underneath it? Or, Sometimes um, it allows farmers to stay on their land if they let a solar. There's a lot of factors. There are a lot of, there are a lot of factors. Yep, yep, yep. And so the other, the other, the kind of the optimistic side of that, or maybe just, it's just that there's a lot of pieces that, that could potentially be addressed too. You know what's what's driving it. There may be a couple different things driving something. So, I'll just jump in, Rachel. You talked about how the plateau and everything was was eighty percent deforested in the nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. It grew back. That was a soft deforestation development. When you build buildings and strip malls and houses, it's more of a hard for deforestation. It doesn't come back. Solar is kind of you know is. So, so my question is, is solar permanent? 
when you put in the solar installation or could it be transitory? Could it come out later um, where a house might not or something? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's a thought. I've, I've heard of that and Michael um, could probably answer this, but I've heard of um, solar farms being leased on ag land with the idea that they'd only be there for a, a certain amount of time and then they would revert back later. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But. It is. The, the lifespan of a, a solar farm proposed today is usually assumed to be about 35 years. And at that time, there has to be a decommissioning plan in place to remove the panels and restore the land to productivity. Um, and how that you interpret productivity is depends on local zoning very often or on, on whether or not it's prime farmland. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's very often the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So solar farms are assumed to be temporary. And part of that assumption derives from the fact that solar technology is advancing so quickly that theoretically in the future, we'll have to have much smaller solar farms to provide the same amount of energy. Mm -hmm. Mm, right, 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 right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, and unlike development, which, you know, you're completely digging up your soil and it's just, you know, you're destroying the agricultural soil where a solar farm is pretty much just on top. So the original soil is still, the good soil is still there. I would assume, I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, okay. I have a comment also. Yeah. If I can. Um, wouldn't we be better off trying to encourage solar development in in more uh, built up areas? I mean, there was a recent uh, piece I saw on television about a school in Arkansas that um, put solar, I mean, all over. It was on, on the roofs of the, uh, the school. It was uh, canopies over the walkways around the school and over their parking lot. And by saving i think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred thousand dollars or more they used that money to help uh, give bonuses to the teachers actually uh, you know i think that's probably a, an initiative that might be more beneficial because it would be a more long-term type of thing and would not have any kind of negative impact on any agro land or on forest no, I agree. And then we sort of brought that up earlier too, but, but abs absolutely, you know, urban, we, we uh, don't utilize, I think, urban areas as much as we could, you know, and, and that our choice for roofs should be, should we plant plants on the top or should we have solar panels, but we should have one of the two, you know, so. Um. Here's a, a question from Sherry, um, from the total portfolio of solutions presented by Project Drawdown, or it's a thought anyway, forest-based, Project Drawdown, forest-based ecosystems can contribute 20% of the total necessary sequestration to reach the climate targets. And I don't, I don't know Project Drawdown, and I don't actually know the numbers of, of, uh, forest contribution. So, but I did copy that question, Sherry, and I'm, and I am curious what, you know, like what FIA's numbers for, for forest contribution to carbon is, so. Uh, by the way, I should, I should that, uh, that next month, uh, uh, East uh, and Winter will be talking more about solar too, so. Oh, okay. I have to paste that question or I'm going to lose it. Oops. All right. Um, so diseases, this is from Tracy, diseases and invasives like emerald ash borer have much more immediate effect on forests than climate change, which is much more gradual. Um, it, it's, it's also an effect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think actually climate change, it's this combination of gradual and then not gradual. So, so we have these sudden effects, like our, maybe the, the winters, we lose winters, you know, some things happen more slowly, but then we suddenly have storms and we suddenly have, you know, more floods or more fires. So, so it's a, it's a combination. And I th think at a certain point we, you know, it builds on itself, but emerald ash borer is certainly something right that can come through 
or we have hemlock woolly adelgid coming in that people are uh, need to manage for immediately. Whereas climate change, we're sort of preparing for, trying to make ourselves resilient for, knowing that it's coming, knowing that we are going to see effects related to that. So, so it's a different kind of preparation. Yeah. Source bit from Project Drawdown. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Chickens and sheep can live on solar farms. There's a question for you, Michael. <laughs> I don't know. Would give them a lot of shade in a in a hot area. Yes, they can. Yeah. The, the short answer to that is yes, they can. Yes. Yeah. Chickens are a little less desirable because they leave droppings on the panels. Oh. Right, and Bonnie just made the comment that climate, climate adding to that conversation that we were just having, that climate change stresses the forest and makes them more vulnerable to diseases and pests of all kinds. Yes, exactly. And so there's the, you have this climate change stress and then you have this fragmentation and urbanization stress and when you, we add them together, then they're less less able to handle short, short other things that come through, like emerald ash borer. Or, um, and I don't know the answer. Michael asked. Um, Michael D asked, "Is it a good idea to clear five to ten acres for go, for grassland for bird and deer habitats?" And I don't think deer need any help. Um, but but. Um, for birds, you know, for that early successional habitat, I, I do not, that's not my area of expertise. So I don't know if five to 10 acres is the thing to do. So somebody else might know that. Yes, Michael Fishman has a-, has a uh, you, you, want, you want much larger areas than that. Larger most, areas. Most, that. Yeah, most grassland birds need minimum areas of 35, 40 acres. Um, are we, are you monitoring wind and blowdown rates? Um, the foot, the FIA data picks up. So of the things that we measure, we, we measure, um, what the trees look like, but, but, you know, so stand size and, and diameters and species and that kind of thing. And we, and we also keep track of when a, a tree, uh, is missing has fallen, you know, over time because we measure the same plots over time, and we do keep track of what the cause was, where we can tell was it harvested or was there, and so and sometimes, you know, you could tell wind throw, you could tell other. Um, sometimes there are also a study that goes through when we have a particular ice storm or something, then they'll be we'll go back in or or we'll help crews to go back in and do that. So, but from the FIA data, without those special studies, from the FIA data themselves, we can sort of change, tell, but, it, but in general, it's not a detailed enough inventory. We have one plot every 6,000 acres. So that's sometime, we'll, we'll see. So, so we're looking at the, you know, constantly looking at the data. You know, everybody's, every year, each state has an analyst that's focusing on that state. And they take a look at the data and look at the change. Um, and it, so far, we haven't seen impacts from wind throw or blowdown apart from when a hurricane comes through or there's a big specific blowdown, but it not generally showing up in the FIA data. Um, unless you get a bit, you know, a big hurricane comes through. So then that shows up like Hugo down south or something like that. Um, but something like you're talking about, the weather's getting windier and things are coming down more, that's not, that's not showing up in our data. Um, <laughs> no more deer, let's see. Yeah, so I think that's everything, yeah. unless I missed something or... No, I think that may be it. So anyway, Rachel, thank you very much on behalf of everybody here. It was a really interesting presentation and uh, and uh, one of the bigger discussions that we've, we've yeah. uh, ever had.
So um, we, yeah. we all uh, very much appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and put my email in the chat in case anybody, if I can spell it, um, has any other questions or wants to get in touch or anything. So I'd be happy to. So thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Bonnie. <laughs>